This video is going to cover all of the approaches to personality psychology with the exception of psychoanalytic and psychodynamic. And then at the end, we'll quickly review um, personality assessment techniques. So we're going to begin with the humanistic perspective. And that perspective developed in contrast to the psychoanalytic perspective, which had fo focused a lot on sick people. That's what Freud focused on. So humanism wanted to focus on healthy people. Um, so when we think about the approach overall that humanists took, they really focused on the goodness of people. They said that people are innately good um, and free will is a key component of this. It said free will was a third force. And that third force word is again, just a word that we use to contrast it against the determinism of the psychoanalytic theory. Um, so our first theorist here is Carl Rogers. And Carl Rogers, um, again, believed that people are innately good, but he talked about the importance of their interactions um, with others. He said that in those interactions, they needed to be genuine, accepting, and empathetic. And um, a key term related to acceptance is unconditional positive regard. And that's an important one to know. So to know that there's no conditions to somebody's love or acceptance for you. Um, within that, again, focusing on the self-concept, they were looking to answer the question, who am I? And um, somebody's response to that would um, influence what we would see in their personality. So if you had a positive self-concept, then um, you would perceive the world more positively and you would have better chances at becoming self-actualized. And if you had a negative self-concept, you'd sort of fall short of what they called your ideal self. And then your personality would show um, unhappiness and dissatisfaction. So that's Carl Rogers. As we move into Abraham Maslow, remember that Maslow had that hierarchy of needs. Um, he focused on healthy and creative people. So for example, he studied the lives of Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, and Eleanor Roosevelt. And in studying those people, he said that they were self-aware, self-accepting, open, spontaneous, loving, caring, secure, things like that. So from that, he developed what it meant to be self-actualized, which then sort of exists at the top of the needs hierarchy. So he said that we have to have our basic lower level needs satisfied first, like safety and food and shelter and love and all of those different things. And as we do, we move up the triangle um, and get closer to self-actualization. Um, one of the criticisms as we look at humanism is that it was overly optimistic. Now, humanism does have a big impact, especially today in positive psychology, counseling, um, things like that. But in criticizing it as overly optimistic, they also said that this is very vague and subjective. So, for example, if someone else looked up to people like Hitler or somebody else, um, then self-actualization would be defined differently. Another criticism is that um, it focuses very much, it takes that individualistic approach. So um, critics say that that encourages selfishness. And then finally, it's criticized for being very naive, so um, not recognizing the human capacity for evil, since its belief is that all people are innately good. Um, as we move into the behavioral perspective, we didn't focus a lot on that because it wasn't around very long. The behavioral perspective um, argues that behavior is personality. So personality is determined by environment. So the environment shapes our behavior through reinforcement contingencies. Um, so if we're able to change the environment, we can change the personality. So with this, they fail to recognize cognition at all. And we know that you have to recognize cognition as part of personality. So sort of a branch off from that, and the only perspective that really focuses on behavioral would be either social cognitive or cognitive behavioral. Those words are used relatively interchangeably um, for our purposes. So uh, Albert Bandura is the first one and he looked at social learning theory. So he says that our personality is created by the interaction between the person, the environment, and the behavioral. This is known as reciprocal determinism or another word that's used is triadic reciprocity and that's used in some other textbooks, and we're gonna use that interchangeably as well. So basically, it says that our actions are determined by the interaction of our environment and then our thoughts, so our cognitive processes. So think about that triangle um, that we saw in your book. He also evaluated self-efficacy. Remember that that's our belief about our abilities in a specific situation, and he says that that has an impact on our actions. When we look at Julian Roeder, 
the focus there is the locus of control. So um, locus of control is kind of a broader viewpoint of how you approach the world. So not self-efficacy, which is in a specific situation. Locus of control is more your overall approach. So if you have an internal locus of control, you believe that you're responsible for what happens to you. So you might study harder or work harder because you believe that that can pay off in the future versus an external locus of control where you believe that what happens is, is just sort of up to luck and chance. Um, Kelly, we didn't really talk about, but I've seen Kelly show up in a few of the review books. So I basically have everything you need to know right there. Um, Kelly's theory is the personal construct theory. Uh, so said that people develop their own constructs that are made of opposites, and then that's how you understand the world around you. So things are either fair or unfair. People are either smart or dumb. Uh, so that's kind of that key component. And then finally, it says that our behavior is influenced by our cognitions, so our thinking, um, and knowing how people have behaved in the past. And if we use those things, we can predict future actions. And then Martin Seligman um, is a big name in psychology right now because he's pretty well known for positive psychology. And Seligman said that we focus a lot on the negatives in understanding others. So we need to focus on the positives like strength and virtue. However, um, how he contributes to personality theory here is just through learned helplessness. So remember the learned helplessness studies, and he looked at how when people have failed in different situations over and over again, then it teaches them to not even try. Criticisms of this theory um, would be that there's too much focus on the situation. Now, the positives of this theory is that it draws attention to the environment, which none of the other theories really do. Um, so in those criticisms that it focuses too much on the situation, they say um, that theorists are not really recognizing our inner traits. So they question, where's the person in this theory since it focuses so much on the environment? The next one we'll move into is the trait perspective. And with the trait perspective, remember that theorists are more interested in describing personality than they are explaining it. But they look at the relative consistency of traits. Um, when I give you those two fancy words there that we haven't studied, that's just in case you see them in May. Um, the nomothetic approach or belief, and then the ideographic belief, and then I show you which theorists fall under each. Uh, I don't think you'll necessarily have to know it, but I would certainly look at it. Um, Cattell and Isinct, relatively self-explanatory. I don't think that they're going to be as big as the big five. So Cattell, we know that Cattell used factor analysis and determined that there were 16 basic personality traits and then um, developed an inventory in order to assess those. And then Isink said that there are two personality dimensions. So remember, um, in your book, there's a graphic that sort of looks like a circle, and then it's divided into four different um, quadrants. And those are, they fall along the lines of stable versus unstable and introverted versus extroverted. Costa and McCray then are who um, are important for developing the big five personality factors. So stability, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. And remember that one of the ways that we remember that is through canoe, so first letter technique. Another theorist um, is Alport. Alport said that there are three types of traits, cardinal, central, and secondary. For cardinal traits, remember that that's like one pervasive defining trait, and very few people have that. So an example would be like Martin Luther King Jr. and the trait of social justice. But most of us don't have those. So central traits are the majority of our primary traits that we would see, so relatively consistent. That could be like honesty, um, extroversion, trustworthiness, all of those different things. And then he also said that we have secondary traits, which are a little bit more varied. So that might be like taste in music. So that's something that is not as consistent and can change over time, but still is seen as part of your personality. When we move into the biological perspective, uh, we didn't focus a lot on the biological perspective, but again, relatively self-explanatory. It's going to look at the contribution of genes, chemicals, and body types to overall personality. We know that traits are not necessarily inherited. There's not a lot of evidence for that, but there's certainly a lot of um, research into that right now. So examples would be that height is largely heritable, intelligence is likely largely heritable, so those might be things that contribute. Temperament, um, however, 
remember that temperament is kind of like your emotional style or the way that you interact with the world. And we know that that's largely biological, at least that's what research is showing us right now, that babies sort of come into the world with um, their temperament. So that would mean that there's a biological basis for that. Two people that we didn't really study, um, Hippocrates is one of the earliest theories. And Hippocrates said that personality is determined by the level of the four humors in your body. And humors are just fluids. So looking at blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. Um, an example of that would be if you have excess blood, that shows up in your personality as cheerful. Now, this theory is not true, um, but it is the first to recognize the importance of biological factors on personality. And then we have Sheldon, um, another early theory. It's the somatotype theory. Sheldon said that there are three body types, endomorphs, mesomorphs, and ectomorphs, and that your body type influences what we see in your personality. So for example, ectomorphs are seen as shy and secretive. Now, Sheldon had questionable methods. Um, his studies haven't been replicated, and actually in his studies, it only really proves correlation, so it doesn't even really show um, a biological basis, but another early perspective. That's kind of it for the overall approaches to personality. There are a few other terms that are related to the self that we should be aware of, and these were kind of discussed at the end of the chapter. Um, and then we move into personality assessment techniques. So how do we actually um, evaluate someone's personality? Now remember, the approach that you take, take to personality is also going to show up in your assessment technique. So there is a chart in your books. I believe it's page 511 that you guys can look at. But just to kind of talk through some of these, self-report personality inventories. Um, so I give you some examples of those and they're used by humanistic trait and cognitive behavioral mainly. So an example of a personality inventory is the MMPI-2. Remember that there's a bunch of true false questions that are asked there. It is one of the most widely used and it was originally intended for psychiatric diagnosis, but this has been updated um, over time. So there are 10 clinical scales, and those assess things like depression, masculinity versus femininity, introversion versus extroversion, and then there are also built-in lie subscales. So since a lot of businesses give the MMPI-2, they're looking to see um, if you're lying so that you would be viewed more favorably if this is part of your interview. The Myers-Briggs is also a personality inventory, and that was a mother-daughter duo that created that and it showed up in really positive types so that nobody really felt bad about themselves. So it's kind of a warm, fuzzy inventory. Um, and so examples of that would be like a thinking type or a feeling type. And then the big five is another example of a personality inventory. Now, all of those are mainly used by the trait perspective. Uh, benefits is that they're pretty reliable and scientifically uh, testable. So uh, no, not only reliable, but valid. Um, a weakness would be that they only explore a limited number of traits because they're so specific. Um, in terms of observation, observation would mainly be used by social cognitive because that's uh, the only one that really considers behavioral. And um, one of the negatives there would be that the results may not apply to the larger population, right? Because we're just observing um, one or just a few individuals. As for experimentation, also used um, by the social cognitive approach almost exclusively. What's good about it is that it can determine cause and effect. However, um, a criticism of that is that um, it's difficult to determine the variables and it's somewhat unethical to manipulate variables. So those are the criticisms there. Surveys are used by trait, social cognitive, or even positive psychology. Um, What's good about that is that the results are reliable and can be generalized to the larger population, but it can be expensive um, and it only gives us correlational findings. Uh, as we move into case studies, mainly used by psychoanalytic or humanistic, what's good about it is that it's pretty cheap, um, but what's bad about it is that it's not generalized to the larger population. So finally, we move into the approaches used by the psychoanalytic and psychodynamic perspective. And remember that they're trying to assess unconscious motives and conflicts. So that's a really difficult thing to do because the individual is not even aware of what's going on in this approach. So they use projective tests. Um, examples of projective tests are the Rorschach and the TAT. 
Um, the Rorschach is a series of ink blots that you interpret, and then that's supposed to say something about what's going on in your unconscious. The tat um, is where you're given an ambiguous picture, and then you have to create a story about it, and the story should give clues as to what's going on in your unconscious. Um, there are a lot of criticisms of the projective test. There's pretty weak reliability and validity since um, the, the therapist could obviously interpret your story one way and then a different therapist could interpret your story another way. And then one final term just to be aware of is the Barnum effect, and that's the tendency to see ourselves in vague stock descriptions of personality, and that's why things like horoscopes and stuff like that um, are so widely accepted by people today. That's it for all of the approaches to personality. Remember that this video did not include psychoanalytic or psychodynamic.